Welcome back to Siegfried Wagner Radio. We're reading Monday, February 23rd, 1942. Analysis of Propaganda by Siegfried Wagner. Good evening. Today, on the 22nd anniversary of the founding of the Red Army, Joseph Stalin, Supreme Commander of all Russians, gave the United Nations again the cue for propaganda campaign, which by radio, pamphlets, and direct infiltration is waged against Germany. Stalin said that it would be ridiculous to identify the German people with the Hitler regime and that the Red Army killed German soldiers only because they invaded Russia under Hitler's command. Stalin did not say anything what I have not been hearing Stalin did not say anything what have not been hearing at the MBS KFL listening post on the Moscow shortwave since the Russian war started. As I have frequently mentioned in these broadcasts, Russian radio propaganda directed at Germany and also other European countries always consistently, conscientiously differentiated between what it calls the Hitler gang and the German people. It assures German listeners at all hours of the day and night that invaded Russia harbors no feelings of revenge against the German people as such, and that the Russian people are concentrating their unmitigated hatred against Hitler and his Nazi gang only. Thus Stalin was merely following the general line of Russian propaganda when he said it would be ridiculous to identify the German people with the Hitler regime, but that he himself felt called upon to make this statement indicates to the propaganda analysis the conclusions which seem vital to this juncture of the war. The first and most obvious conclusion is, of course, that Stalin's statements was made for the German people to hear it. Coming from the head of the Russian state direct, German listeners to Moscow broadcasts were reassured that what Moscow radio has told them in the past was not merely a trick for propaganda, but the actual policy of the state of Russia. They were given the promise that whatever the fate of Hitler gang and the hands, whatever the fate of the Hitler gang at the hands of the victorious Red Army might be, they themselves have nothing to fear. In giving this promise, Stalin must have been moved by either of two or both alternatives. He may have he may have information that the unrest and dissension among the German people has reached such a critical state that the strategically opportune moment has arrived for him to shed all reserve and to come right out in the open with a friendly hand outstretched to the German people to allay their fears in case Hitler is defeated. In the case Hitler is defeated. Yeah, ask him how they like East Germany. Supporting this theory is the fact that the Russian intelligence service being the best in the world, particularly as regards to what goes on inside Germany. Supporting this theory is the fact that the Russian intelligence service being the best in the world, particularly as regards to what goes on inside Germany. Before the signing of the Hitler-Stalin Pact in September 1939, Russian agents in Berlin were so well posted and fast moving as to enable Moscow radio to, to report Dr. Goebbels' private excursions to the homes of to some movie stars and only 15 minutes after he had left his home. In this particular instance, Stalin's men must have been right at the doorstep of Goebbels' homes and must have followed his car to its destination and then in a split second time relay the report by shortwave radio to Moscow. Truly a feat that would make any intelligence officer anywhere in the world turn green with envy. Of course, after the Russian war started, Russian agents were no longer so free in their movements inside Germany. But they had an uncounted number of German underground helpers, all the stalwarts of the old German Communist Party. Communist Party. Started this again. Of course, after the Russian war started, Russian agents were no longer free in their movements inside Germany. But they have uncounted number of German underground helpers, all the stalwarts of the old German Communist Party who either joined the Nazi Party in 1933 or simply vanished from sight, but who nevertheless worked unceasingly on the overthrow of Hitler regime and the coming of the communist communism in Germany. 
These men, women, and even children constitute what is probably the best organized fifth column in the world. They penetrate everywhere in Germany and are able to give reliable information about the state of mind of the German working people as well as about what goes on in the highest Nazi party and military quarters. It was primarily on the count of this Russian fifth column that Hitler needed Himmler, Heinrich, and their Gestapo and all sorts of vigilante organizations to boot to keep things under control from the very beginning of his re regime. Homeland Security, Patriot Act. Subsequently, Stalin is undoubtedly the best informed man today as regards to the actual state of affairs among Hitler's people. And his, propaganda, and his information may have indicated that the time is right for direct propaganda assault on the German people by the highest authority the Russian nation could muster. Naturally, there is also an alternative that Stalin conducted the strategical maneuver in order to merely to weaken Hitler's striking force when after the spring and mud period, the German dictator will rally all he has for a counteroffensive. But the time for Hitler's offensive, if he's still strong enough to wage one, comes only in May, or even later, in the central and northern parts of Russia. Hence, I for one would say that Stalin made his offer of security to the German people for a twofold reason. First, because he thinks that the state of mind of the German people is right for it, and second, because he needs a propaganda victory before Hitler starts his spring offensive. But by throwing the money monkey wrench behind the lines of Hitler's fighting Solodeska, Stalin also needs to set an example. British and American shortwave propaganda addressed to Germany did not give the German people to understand that the United Nations may not deal too harshly with them if they help finishing the war by throwing out Hitler. But in spite of the Atlantic Charter, there is nothing concrete about this. It is all more by way of hints and implication than by way of direct promises. In addition, the United Nations stations pursue a policy of threatening dire consequences for the Germans if they don't come around to our way of thinking. This is in direct contrast to the Russian propaganda policy whose effectiveness is thus considerably cut down. But what is worse? is that it is a clear indication that the present President Roosevelt, Prime Minister Churchill, and Joseph Stalin have not yet decided upon a unified grand strategy of propaganda. The Kremlin pulls in its direction, and London and Washington in the other. And in this tug of war, real propaganda successes go by the window. In all the years of my propaganda analysis, I have over and over reiterated that there is no nation which can talk to Germany with greater authority than the United States of America. There is too much within the German people which tends to discredit the British government and the British promises of rings to give the British promises the ring of sincerity and there's too much anti-communist feeling in Germany that it is based on Germany's post-war experience with communism to make Moscow the proper place from which to start a campaign to lure the Germans away from Hitler. And there is probably no statesman in the camp of the United Nations who realizes this better than Joseph Stalin. He knows what havoc communists have caused in Germany. He knows that Hitler came to power because he promised the Germans to eradicate communism. And Stalin also knows that there are many Germans who accuse at least part of the Communist Party that it actually helped Hitler on with the throne by throwing in their lot with the Nazis. Kind of like how Obama was put in for us. Under these conditions, Stalin must be fully aware that he is the least likely person in whom promises and assurances the German people would set faith. If he, among all the much better qualified statements of the United Nations, got up and took their propaganda offensive in spite of his obvious handicaps, then the idea does not seem so far-fetched that whenever other reasons he may have had he wanted also to demonstrate to his allies what should be done at this very moment. Alright, this is what Stalin had to say. Under these conditions, Stalin must be fully aware that he is the least likely person in whose promises and assurances the German people would set faith. So they don't trust Stalin at all. If he, among all the much better qualified statements of the United Nations, got up 
and took the propaganda offensive in spite of his obvious handicaps, then the idea does not seem so far-fetched that whatever other reasons he may have had, he wanted also to demonstrate to his allies what should be done at this very moment. And that seems to me the most important conclusion to be drawn from Stalin's speech. Summing it up, it comes down to this. Stalin thinks the time is right for the direct offer to the German people. Stalin needs such an offer now in view of the impending German Spring Offensive. But because nobody else seems to be willing to make such an offer, he himself does it even though he knows that his voice carries the least weight, carries the least weight with the German people. Evidently, he wants the voice of America to pitch in and win the vital battle of propaganda. Here in this country, public opinion does not seem as yet ready to accept Stalin's invitation. We are in this war for only a few months. We have nothing to be gotten. We have not yet gotten our bearings, and the wounds we received in the opening battles are still too fresh, and the sturt still hurt too much. The wounds we received in the opening battles are still too fresh, and still hurt too much, to let us coolly and calmly fight, coolly and calmly weigh the chances of propaganda campaign which would promise leniency to the German people. So the war just started. There's nothing in the Americans that's saying they want to like lay down now. They didn't even want to be in the war. Japan attacked, Germany attacked, and you know the war's only been going on for less than a year. It's February 1942. But Stalin's trying to tell the German people, we just hate Hitler, we love you. But Stalin spoke not for nothing. His people and his country have been hurt incomparably worse than the United States. And if in spite of the devastation of Russia at the hands of Hitler's hordes, he can take kindly, take a kindly attitude towards German people, a juncture must have been reached in this war which opens the way to understanding with the German people or which forges us to open such, as, such a way. He can take kindly attitude toward the German people. A juncture must have been reached in this war which opens the way to an understanding with the German people or which forges us to open such a way. It is for this reason that I look with great expectations forward to the President Roosevelt's explanation of, of this juncture in 30 minutes from now. And that is my analysis of propaganda for the present. The shortwave stations which I have referred to are Moscow RV, London JRH, GRH, American shortwave stations WCBX, WRUL, WOWL, and KGEI. Good night. So that was February 23rd, 1942. Stalin.